thing where we've either said this or someone's talking to us about how God's speaking to us. And they really addressed that in there in a great paragraph and said, you might want to be a little careful about that. Who's really doing the talking? And they give you a method in there to kind of check that out. We conclude the period of meditation with a prayer. So we've done this, and the book is very clear that when I get done with this stuff, I need to also then do a meditation. And I conclude it with a prayer. God, show me all through this day what my next step is to be. Please, God, give me whatever I need to take care of such problems. I ask especially, God, for freedom from self-will. Especially for freedom from self-will. Careful to make no request for myself. I may ask for myself if others will be helpful. Do not pray for my own selfish ends. I waste a lot of time doing that. It doesn't work. If circumstances warrant, wives or friends, join me in my morning meditation. Remember, I told you strict spiritual disciplines, if you want to practice them. This is the second time in the 11th step it's told you about a morning meditation. If I belong to a religious domination which requires a morning devotion, I attend to that also. I can select and memorize a few set prayers, many helpful books, get these suggestions from priests, ministers, rabbis. Be quick to see. This is an instruction. Be quick to see where religious people are right. Make use of what they have to offer. Now I get some tools to work with when I walk out my front door. I get these in the 10th step and I get them in the 11th. As I go through my day, I'm going to pause when agitated or doubtful. When I came to AA and in various times in my recovery, agitated and doubtful was my common state of consciousness. <laughs> it's where I lived. This is a great tool. Pause when agitated or doubtful and ask God for the right thought or the right action. I don't know if you think about this, but the majority of the time, every action that you take is preceded by a thought. If you're completely asleep to your thought life, let's go back to this issue of choice. I imagine on Friday night, if I'd ask you sober, are you going through the day making choices? I imagine the vast majority of you would have said yes. Am I correct in that? Well, let me throw out a few things for you to think about. You didn't choose your parents, your gender, your sex, your name, where you were born, the culture in which you were raised. You didn't choose a single belief system that was formulated in the first 10 years of your life, most of which you are still acting on today. You didn't choose a single thing, including all of these belief systems that you are currently making decisions and taking actions on today. That's why the book uses the word driven. All you have to do is look at your own experience to see if what I'm saying is true. How many times have you continually repeated a pattern that is not in your best interest? Do you think that's because you're choosing to? <laughs> see, the steps, what the steps do that is so incredible is the book in the doc's opinion talks about a psychic change. And in the back in the spiritual appendix, they talk about a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism. The steps reprogram your hard drive. All of us. Think of, think of a computer. The computer cannot put out anything more that's in the hard drive, can it? Well, I got some news some of you are not going to like. You've got a hard drive and your computer can't put out any more than what's in the hard drive. These steps, these practices are designed to remove the viruses and replace them. <laughs> and that leads to a whole complete change in what you do. It's still not that you're making choices. It's just that you've been reprogrammed. That's what all these practices are all about. Incredible stuff when you start to wake up to it. But we, you know, pause when agitated or doubtful and ask God for the right thought or the right action. You imagine the change that's got to take place in you before you can even do this? That you can even be awake to do enough to do that? Constantly remind ourselves we're no longer running the show. Let me go back to one thing in this same area. Your ego will use guilt, shame, and remorse and regret to constantly beat yourself up with. When you understand that you had no choice you will get free of the guilt, shame, regret, and remorse 
and hopefully it will move you to pursue a course of action to bring about a change in your thought life and how you come at things. The reason we sit in judgment so much on ourselves and whether it's in our past associated with drinking or sober is we actually think we're choosing to do all this stuff. That's insanity. What sane person would choose that? And when I begin to wake up to that, the, 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 my ego, my mind using guilt, shame, and remorse. I mean, a little bit of guilt is fine. If I do something that creates harm in somebody and I see it in their eyes, I need just enough guilt to make me realize that I did something that created harm and I don't want to do it. Beyond that, I don't need any more. None. Remorse is spiritual pride. Regret is spiritual pride. It's the part of me that plays God that thinks I could have done it different. If I could have done it different, I would have done it different. What I realize is am I going to be willing to pursue a course of action that will bring about a change in my programming, which will bring about a complete change in how I interact with myself, you, and the world. And that's all that this work, this incredible stuff we've been talking about this weekend, it does. That's why, Joe, Joe's, we've talked about this a little. That's why self-help books are useless to us. Because it doesn't change how my thought life or how I'm viewing the world. You know, our, our, we've got rooms full. If I took all the self-help books from all the homes in here, I could start another bookstore. <laughs> how often have they benefited us? Our problem is lack of power, and we need to be, we need a psychic change. And then we go through this, and this power comes in, and this psychic change comes about, and then the very thing the self-help book talked about that other people seem to work with, now we can practice so it goes on and say, remind yourself you're no longer running these shows. Say numerous hells many times each day. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. I'll throw out a paradox for you. Great book called Who Cares? Theme of the whole book. Thy will be done. Do whatever you want. Thy will be done. Do whatever you want. Thy will be done. Do whatever you want. And his deal is they're one and the same. Think about that. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. I'm then, it says if I do all this, these disciplines, 10 and 11, look at these promises. I'm then in much less danger of what? Excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, or foolish decisions. That's one of the most powerful promises in the entire big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you'll do this work and begin to work with these disciplines, this is how you get to go through the day. Let In much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, or foolish decisions, you get to become much more efficient. You do not tire easily, for you're not burning up energy foolishly as you did when you're trying to arrange life to suit yourself. It, everything in the book from title page up to here, it works, it really does. I am undisciplined, so I let God discipline me in the simple way that I has just been outlined in the book. The strict spiritual disciplines of 10 and 11, having pursued the course of action outlined in 1 through 9. Good morning. I'm Joe. I'm an alcoholic. Can we bring this mic? Oh, yeah. How's everybody this morning? Good. Uh, you know, I always wish on Sunday mornings that we would have had more time together. Um, Mark's going to take a break because he's going to be less busy, and I'm going to take a break because I'm going to be a little more busy in the next year or so. Um, Another dream has come true in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I remember the first time it really struck me when an actual, an actual dream came true. I hadn't thought about it for years and years and years. I was about a year sober. I was back in Battle Creek, Michigan. Uh, uh, was asked to speak at a meeting in Battle Creek and uh, my family went. And um, I didn't think of it before I spoke and you know I just talked. and. Um, 
at the end, um, the whole room stood up, and there's my mother and my brother and my sister and an old friend of ours, Larry, and um, and then it hit me that when I was about, I knew it was before I had a driver's license. I have a memory that I wasn't really drunk. Um, I don't think I was taking a lot of drugs at the time. I was pretty young, and at a drive-in movie theater, <coughs> I don't know if I fell asleep, I don't know if it was an awake dream or a sleep dream, doesn't really matter, but as a child, as a kid, at a drive-in movie theater, I had a dream that, and in my mind, I, the memory was that it was, I watched it on the screen, that um, I was standing in front of a large group of people, and that they were all standing up and clapping, and that my family was there, and the feeling in the dream was that everything with my family was okay. And even at that age, everything with my family was not okay. I wasn't okay. And um, the first time I spoke in Battle Creek, Michigan, that dream came true. Um, uh, I was in amends. I um, had a big list of amends in Battle Creek because I'd grown up there and I'd caused a lot of harm there. And uh, two or three other visits to Battle Creek sober, I could barely go anywhere looking over my shoulder, a lot of people were still <laughs> And on this visit, when I was willing to make those amends in Battle Creek, my friend Larry and I, whenever I came to town, he's a guy that I drank with, I later became his sponsor. Um, you know, how does that happen to a guy like me? Um, they didn't even really like me much when we hung out together. Um, uh, uh, Two or three other visits to Battle Creek when I was not willing to make amends or ready to make amends, scared, um, terrified to walk down the street. On this visit, I was willing to make amends. Larry and I went to a meeting. <coughs> then we went to this club where we would always go for coffee and whatever. And on other visits, maybe I'd see one person from the past, hoping not to see anybody else. On that visit, when I was willing to make amends, I remember 10 or 12 people walked into that club that night and I got to make appointments with them. And I got to sit with my mother that I thought was a relationship that could never be healed. She, she passed away a year ago t today and uh, she went in a really amazing way. She, uh, I had talked to her on my 50th birthday, which was J June 4th. And um, the, the, the last time I had seen her was about a year earlier, face to face. And when I left um, that visit, after seeing each other for a week, she said goodbye to me. She wasn't necessarily very ill. She had a little trouble walking. She was becoming a little senile, but, and it was with no drama, just like when your mother is just clear. It wasn't like, oh, I'll never see you again. She was just like, this will be the last time we see each other. 10 minutes before our, my friend Larry was gonna take me to the airport. My mind said, well, why didn't you bring this up on Monday when I got here, you know? And uh, I wanted to say something, and then my thought was go in the bathroom, say a prayer. Is there anything that I need to say before I go? Because I knew she was clear. And um, my thought in the bathroom was, let her do it the way she wants. Maybe for the first time in your life. And... Um, um, Sure enough, it was the last time we saw each other face to face. We stayed in touch, of course, um, and I had called her on my 50th birthday. And the next day, she called my sister and said, you better come on up to Battle Creek. I'm gonna go now, I'm tired. My sister said, oh no, you're, you know, my sister's one of those people who wants it, you to hold on. Oh, you're, no you're not, you're fine. I'll come, when, I'll come Sunday, this was on a Wednesday. My mom said to her on the phone, I'll wait for you. Sunday my sister comes, my mom says, you better call your brother, he lives down the road. He came over and she said to him, your brother from Hawaii, my other brother, they won't, he won't be here for this. And I wonder how she knew that. And your brother from Texas, I was in Texas at the time, he won't be here. How did she know that I wouldn't come to Battle Creek? And if you need to say anything, I'm gonna go now. And they said what they needed to say, she laid down and went to sleep. Uh, doctor said he never saw anything like it. There was no heart failure. Of course, the heart stopped, but there was no heart failure. There was no organ failure, and she got to do that. Uh, of course, I called the wrong people. I wanted some self-pity. I, <laughs> I wanted some pity, and I called uh, Mark first. He was right there in Dallas, and uh, 
for me, that's what that was about. Uh, being with a close friend that I'd known for 20 years when that came in my life. And, and you know, I might have helped a couple people in Dallas and caused some harm and gotten fired. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, it was all good. You know, there's my, my best friend firing me, and we we're just both kind of like, well, what are you going to do today? You know, it was like <laughs> anything else. It was like the next thing. And, uh, um, uh, so I called Mark. He said, what a great way for someone to go. No pity there, right? Called my sponsor, and he said, gee, I hope I get to go like that. <laughs> called my teacher from India. He goes, oh, it's so nice when Westerners can do that because, you know, most Tibetans choose when they get to go, too. I thought, damn, I should have picked another group of people. <laughs> and then I realized it was perfect. And, uh, she got to go like that. And uh, I thought that relationship could never be healed. I put that woman through hell. And uh, she went, and there's grief and pain, but I found out. Because I can compare it, even though I cared a lot more about my mother than I did my father, but that was healed in amends at his grave. And I had a great amount of love for my father. But that kind of grief, 70% of it is selfishness because you're not done. How dare you go before I'm all that? And that wasn't there. And I remember Don telling a story a long time ago about losing two friends in the same week. And, um, and sure enough, um, four days after my, or maybe a week after my mother died, my oldest friend in Alcoholics Anonymous passed away, 30 years sober, Sandy Kenner from Denver. He'd been in my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I knew he was a goofball when I was in a fog, and I knew he was a goofball when he died. But we were great friends. But the last visit that he and I had, same visit when I saw my mother in Michigan, I saw him in Denver. I left Denver not having been honest with Sandy Kenner for the first time in our 20-year friendship. And I didn't tell him that I felt very sad for him. And I didn't talk to him the way that I used to in a respectful, loving way. And left knowing, oh, you know, we'll see each other again. We'll get another time. That's a dangerous assumption. Now, I don't think we need to live like today's our last day, you know, because you might knock out the boss and, you know, uh, do a couple nasty things and wake up and there's a tomorrow. But I think with, with people in our lives, with people in our lives, we actually should live like that and not take uh, important relationships, important things. Everything I've ever taken for granted in these last 20 years, I've lost. I've done it with three engagements. Today I'm glad, I'm happy to say to you, I'm glad I didn't get married to any one of those three women and we're all great friends, I can say that at the same time. And I say that because I believe if, uh, I believe I would have missed what's happened in the last five or six years. Um, I never got stuck in Battle Creek, Michigan. God, I still know guys that are just, they're no different than when we were like 24, 20, 22 years old. They want to leave and they can't. It's like alcoholism. You want to quit drinking and you can't. One day they're going to get out of Battle Creek. I got out of that when I was young because they sent me away. <laughs> I had no choice about that, you know. They sent me somewhere they shouldn't have because I learned a little bit more than I should have. Or should have. Maybe I should have. Maybe it was perfect. And, uh, you know, you go from Boone's Farm Apple Wine in Battle Creek, Michigan, where you're, all you'd say to your friends is, what do you want to do tonight? I don't know. What do you want to do tonight? To Boston and New York and LSD-25 within a one-month period from Boone's Farm Apple Wine. My first drug besides marijuana was LSD-25 from one of um, Richard Alpert and Timothy Leary's chemists who used this prep school that my parents sent me as a front. He taught chemistry and made LSD for, for those guys. And um, it was a pretty shocking, uh, you know, I'm not afraid of uh, profound uh, changes in consciousness. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> I was in India for five years, and one night it uh, powers out, and it's cold, and I'm, I'm alone, and it's my first year in India. So what do I do? I pull out my Walkman, and I pull out a tape, and it happened to be a tape of, in, in the dark. Reached in this drawer where I had some AA tapes, pulled out a tape, put it in its mark from about four years before any of this stuff with India even happened. And I'm laying there, I'm freezing to death, I'm listening to this tape, and about halfway through, Mark goes, you don't have to go to India and study with the Dalai Lama. <laughs> and I'm like, Jesus, how did he know? 
<laughs> and I've heard a lot of teachers come back from India and say, you know, you don't have to go to India to get enlightened. But there is one thing you do have to go to India to have the experience of being in India. Um, you can't theorize about living in India in Battle Creek, Michigan. Um, uh, I mean, how does a guy like me get halfway or three-fourths of the way through amends and get made the director of a program for the National Council on Alcoholism? to work with kids, when in two years before, you would have kept me away from your, you would have kept me away from your house. People didn't want me, around. people were afraid of me. I was afraid of me, they should have been afraid of me. They were afraid of me way before I was afraid of me. They had, I had a drink, other people had a problem with my drinking way before I did. I was baffled because when I finally found a solution, they, they started asking what's wrong with you. That's really confusing when you finally find something that works. So that first time through amends, I mean, and, and my mother heard me speak when that first dream came true, and she said, you're not even the same person. I've never even heard you talk that long in your whole life. I used to be really quiet and withdrawn. And my mother, who never raised her voice to anyone ever, used to say, why don't you say something to your dad when he gets like that? Gave the best answer I ever knew. I don't know. <laughs> Why do you drink like that? I don't know. Why do you in the pivot? I don't know. Why can't you start? I don't know. What's wrong with me? Came here, met a guy named Don Pritz. Found out what's wrong with me. Not from him. He asked me to look in that place I didn't want to go in. He told me I wouldn't have to go into that place alone in my first inventory. He told me when I said, I can't speak at this meeting after two days of a fist step, he said, I know you can't. Go in the bathroom, say a prayer. Maybe there's something that can help you speak. Three years, I got sober in 82. 1985, we're going to go to the International in Montreal. He let me drive the, the, this camper with his family in it. I thought, my God, my sponsor trusts me. He said, I don't trust you. I trust God. <laughs> He's never trusted me. I'm a loose cannon. I'm liable to do anything. And I've been well behaved this weekend. And um, I'm standing in front of 7,000 people at the International in Montreal, not in the stadium, at one of the smaller meetings. <laughs> and uh, I remember uh, the next International in, 90, in 1990 listening to my sponsor speak in the Kingdom in Seattle, the Third International in 1995 in San Diego. They asked me to speak on one of the four absolutes, and I thought, I can't speak on that. And my sponsor said, I know you can. Yeah, I know you can't. Why don't you get on your knees and say a prayer? Maybe there's something that can help you do that. It was on one of the four absolutes that I had absolutely no experience with. And he said, well, they always give you stuff to talk about that you don't know anything about. And speakers are just the sickest people in AA. They want to keep you busy all the time, going around different places. That maybe there's somewhere somebody can help you in some other city. You know? <laughs> it's not the wellest ones that are going around speaking. It's the sickest ones. They need a lot of help. To then be moved to De to, from Denver. I was comfortable in Denver. And I have never been able to be allowed to settle for comfort for very long. Because I'll worship comfort. I'll turn a groove, you know you get in a groove, and then all of a sudden it's a rut, because you stayed in the groove, and then all of a sudden it's a, it's a grave, and then all of a sudden there's a casket, and then all of a sudden they're putting nails in the casket, it's time to do the work again. And, uh, all of a sudden I'm living in LA, I didn't want to move to LA, I shared a great house with Mark, sponsored down the street, working with tons of people, serving on the state committee. And all of a sudden, I'm living in L.A. Because I said yes to an amends. Went to my dad's grave, got free of resentment that years and years and years of therapy, including becoming a therapist, never healed. With the majority of AA and people telling me, you can't make amends to someone that's dead. You lost your chance. I didn't lose my chance. My chances were less than average anyway when I got here because I have grow, grave emotional and mental disorders. Then all of a sudden I'm 15 years sober, I'm doing too much of everything. 
that you guys told me I should do to stay sober, work with others, carry the message. And it's not by the nature of those things that I hit bottom at 15 years. It was what I did with the, those things, what I turned them into. They're all good things. We should all carry the message in our own way. Should every one of us be a speaker or be doing these kind of things? No, then who would be making the coffee? It's more important. Who would be here? God, you know one of the biggest mistakes teachers make is they don't appreciate students and they're no longer students themselves. One of the only good things in the field of psychiatry is that most psychiatrists have a psychiatrist. Most of them need a psychiatrist. <laughs> How many teachers do you know that aren't two students anymore? They become teachers. The most enlightened human being that I've ever met in a physical body, the 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet, is still a student. My personal teacher is one of his tutors. Now, how does that happen for a guy like me? All I did was admit that I'd had enough in L.A. and that I was doing too much and that it was killing me. And I was 15 years sober and I was working with way too many people. I was speaking way too much. The tapes from the Salvation Army had become something. They hadn't. I thought they had. I had become somebody. To become someone in an anonymous program was a horrible thing. You didn't do that to me. I did that in my mind. I'm 15 years sober, I'm hitting bottom with all this. What a great city to hit bottom with self-indulgence than Los Angeles. A little hard to hit bottom in self-indulgence in Battle Creek, Michigan. There's not much to indulge yourself in. You've got to have indulgences to get hit bottom with self-indulgence. Mark knew I was spending like eight to nine, ten, six to eight thousand dollars a month on I don't know what. 15 years sober. My rent, I didn't even have a home. <laughs> I had a $700 rent and a leased car. And I was just doing way too much. My thought was, okay, move back to Colorado. Chill out. Go back to where your sponsor is and the elders that you know. You won't have to work with so many people. Maybe you won't speak for a while. I thought that was a great plan. It was a lot less than God had for me. Through a series of un incredible experiences, I end up, I couldn't, my, thank God for the ego. You know, we hate some of the things that bring us back to God. Alcohol. If you're new and you still hate what alcohol did to you, you better wake up to that it brought you to God. Imagine hating resentment. You haven't gotten anywhere if you hate resentment. You've got to make friends with your enemies. One of my teachers always says, and this is a man whose country was robbed. He had to leave his country. M millions of his people have been killed. And that you hear him talk about the Chinese people that invaded his country. And he said, you've got to love your enemies. You should dedicate your spiritual life to your enemies because they're the ones that bring you to it over and over and over, both the internal and the external enemies. Now, I don't like resentment when it hurts people or blocks me off or makes me feel miserable. But thank God for the stuff. Imagine if we just did six and seven and then we were perfect. We wouldn't be here in AA anymore <laughs> for the new person that needs to hear what we have to say. And how do we know what he, he needs to hear? Maybe he needs to hear a guy who pukes and shits and this and that. Maybe he needs to know that we're human and that we make mistakes. And maybe when you find out your sponsor's human like when I did, it frees you up to be human and you don't have to be perfect anymore because none of us are ever going to be. We know what we do to those that, are, that become close to perfect or perfect. We kill them. Yeah. You got to make friends with them. I said something yesterday about I wish there was a better word than being current with every amends you were consciously aware of. And there is a better word. And it's in our book. And they call it We've Entered the World of the Spirit. And they even tell you what your next function is. I feel sorry for people that think 10, 11, and 12 are about maintenance, the maintenance steps. Do you just want to maintain what you got from 1 through 9, or are you still hungry? Mark always says, you think he was getting a little too much with those amends yesterday? The question is, how free do you want to be? We've given power all over the country when we were drinking. We've given our power to other people. And if you don't think you've given them power, look at the truth in your inventory. You go back in the ninth step and you get that power back. It's not taking anything. It's freeing them up from the, 
and what you put on them. Every time you make amends, there's a little more and a little more. And you get hungry. And the craving kicks in. It's a good craving. I know a kid that had amends in five continents. Here's a kid that was born in England, raised in France, grew up in Asia, came to America, and also lived in South America. So anybody that's unwilling to go back to New York or California, I'll tell you about JP. He got to amends. He had 350 amends in five different continents. We put him in piles of North America, South America, England, France, and Asia. And he looked at me, and he's a cocky little young guy, still is. The other day he called me a big fat liar or something like that in on an email, just joking. Right? I call him a spoiled little brat. Right? He started in North America, and he came to me the day he finished his amends cards, and he said, I'm going to finish every one of these amends no matter how long it takes to prove to you the program doesn't work. Finished amends in North America, went to England, France, South America, and Asia. One week after his last amends, he was a totally different person. His father passed away and inherited a zillion dollars in a multi-million dollar company he's been running for the last 11 years, and this kid could not have done that six months earlier. The opposite of that is a kid from South Central Los Angeles who was 30 years old when he got sober. He'd never been to the beach. The beach is 20 minutes away from South Central. He never left a five mile radius. But he had 350 amends because he broke into homes. He used to make cold calls on neighborhoods and get down on his knees and pray, dear God, please show me the homes that I broke into. And this guy has some unbelievable stories from some of these families. Will you get down on your knees and pray with us? We're so happy for you. We need your help. Our son has a dr Amazing. He finished 350 amends in a five-mile radius rather than five continents, and he's never been the same. G.W. Taylor. Amazing guy. Saw him just a few months ago for the first time in six years. He's had his own path. I've had my own path. You have your own path. But to tap into that and to get into the flow of that, you know, is something you really don't want to miss. There, uh, for me, seems to be a tremendous correlation between uh, completion of amends and uh, life cycles I've had since sobriety. Got sober in Denver, and uh, uh, that's where Joe and I came to know each other, and as I moved through the amends process there, when I look back on it, completion of amends led to also completing a cycle in Denver, and then from Denver going down to uh, Texas and starting out in uh, Houston, Texas. It, it, it's interesting what how God works. Uh, I told you that I, I worked in the field of chemical dependency since 91. I assure you I am the last guy that that field ever wanted, let alone wanted to get into. <laughs> and yet I know exactly why I'm there. I know exactly why I'm there. Um, what I brought back into that field, at least in Texas and in every place I've been associated with, is that without God, without this program, without spirituality, the real alcoholic and the real addict is going to die a horrible death. Uh, and what I brought back into that because of my passion and love for this program and my experience is that very thing. In every program I've been associated with, by the time I left that program at the Heart Center, all of it was spirituality and God. And uh, the outcome studies with people who have gone through those places is dramatically different than you would find anywhere else in the country. Have I been popular in that field? No, I'm not popular anywhere I go. <laughs> you can tell it bothers me too. Um, <laughs> So I, I am exactly working in the field that God wants me to work in. And uh, the thing evolves. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I left the field for a while and, and then uh, over the years attracted chronic relapsers. And then a man approaches me and he had been a chronic relapser and, and said, you know, I've got this, uh, I got this ranch and I want to try and help chronic relapsers. And I got this field of dreams, but I got no ball players. I understand you know a lot of real sick people. 
<laughs> and I wasn't offended at that because what he said was true. And uh, I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. So I went up and he and I sat down and, and uh, uh, we started that journey three and a half years ago. And 250 people that the world and their families have given up have come through there. And last, last time I looked, 80% of them had never had a drink or a drug since they left that place. Um, you know, the power of one. Joe did work with one man in New York City, and uh, he and I have, uh, it's like an extended family for us back in New York City, but off the work he did with one man, if you went back there today, they do a fellowship of the spirit that's four to 500 people attend, and there's all kinds of groups that is so solution-oriented. Just, you know, one alcoholic with the power of God in their life literally can impact thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. And you don't get to have a say in that. You just get to be used as a, as a tool and as, a, you know, as, as an instrument. I mean, I, I was thinking about that because, again, Joe and I got a lot of history together. and We couldn't even hit our ass with both hands when we got sober. And he's, he's in the process of buying a spiritual retreat center in California. And I'm CEO of a company. And it's like, it's all a big joke to he and I. Because when <laughs> you know it's just uh, see and you don't get from there to here on your power you understand the point I'm trying to make it is impossible you don't get from where I was in 1982 to where I am today on your power you know we started getting asked to do these things in 1994 I mean how do you do things like this you know he and I a standard question we ask ourselves is why would anybody want to hear anything we have to say um We've never been very impressed with ourselves. Uh, one of my favorite books, uh, written by a man, I've met him actually, uh, he, he wrote the book, uh, Not God. Uh, he's made a life study out of us. He lives in uh, uh, Michigan. Um, wonderful man, a little short guy, a little heavy set. loves alcoholics. He has made a life study of us. So he wrote the book, Not God, you've heard of that. He wrote a second book called The Spirituality of Imperfection. Because what he saw was he saw what a profound change the steps in God and AA brought about in us. And he saw that literally the worldwide implications of this simple 12-step program. So his life passion has been studying us. And so one of the things that really uh, his last book was called The Spirituality of Imperfection, which he took a look at, at us and our spiritual practices and, and how that fits uh, in with us. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote a phrase out of that book because I think it sums us up. Uh, a man is a God that shits, is in the book. <laughs> and I thought to myself, that's at one, at the one hand, you know, it can hit you a certain way, but the spirituality imperfection. Uh, you know, I'm an ass, you're an ass, and that's about the best it's going to get. Uh, <laughs> And to understand that, I think Joe made such a great point of, thank God my defects were not taken from me. Uh, you know, uh, you, you know, I'd been like David Koresh, and we'd had 200 rewritten the big book, and we ain't coming out. Uh, <laughs> you know, thank God. I, and I told Joe this one time. I said, sometimes your self-will-run riot is God's will for me. You know, so uh, I think that's probably the way it's going to be, uh, you know, right up till the day that uh, uh, I leave this body mind organism that I'm housed in. Uh, I fall short every day. And uh, I also you also got to get at peace with that. Uh, you know, there's no arrival place that you get. But so much of all this for all of me always got connected into moving through this amends process. And seeing that as I begin to clean up the wreckage of my past, the amount of peace, inner peace. See, the work of AA, the work of the steps, is inner work that brings about an external change in your environment, in every, in every phase of your life. So it's all, it's all really inner work, and, and amends is such a key piece of that. A friend of mine said this one time, I think there's a lot to be said about what amends does to people, is, is we steal a piece of their heart and we get a chance to give it back to them. Uh, like Joe, uh, I had made, uh, made amends and made peace. And then, see, and this is how God works. I told you, we, we forget this. 
You know, in the third step prayer, we, we make this statement to this God. We say, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do with me as you want. And when that has happened and it doesn't feel good, I forget I said that. <laughs> for example, in 1999, uh, I had worked for this company for seven years uh, and they let me go. I didn't know why, and I now I don't know what your experience is when you get laid off, but I still have these bills. This income has taken a dramatic hit, but these bills have remained constant. That produced that produces something called fear. <laughs> so I'm faced with this. Oh, this is cute, God. Uh, and I uh, I was raised with the work ethic. It's uh, Norwegians. Uh, are raised that way. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to find work and sending out resumes and nothing's happening. But, of course, over a five-month period, a whole bunch of things happened. Is On an intuitive level, I knew that I was supposed to put my stuff in storage, and, and I'd never gone to a class reunion. I graduated from high school in 1964, and they were having a 35-year class reunion. So I wasn't doing anything at the time, so I uh, thought I'd go back for that reunion. And... And in the middle of that, my last two remaining amends, I was able to find them, which was to, uh, I had a, a son who I saw one time when he was like three months old in a courtroom. Gotten a girl pregnant in 1968. I'd gone to bed one time. Nine months later to the day, this event happens. And albeit I had done what they asked me to do financially at that time, uh, I'd never been able to find him again. She'd remarried and all the subsequent stuff. And But to make a long story short, I was able to find her and to find him and to make amends. And they hadn't talked in three years. So I was able to give her his phone. I mean, it's just bizarre. And to make that amend and, and then to to go to this class reunion with these, with these people and to uh, make the last of my amends that was in my consciousness. Uh, what what a peace that that brings in you, and then then out of that, then ultimately being off for five or six months in there, and and then having this situation develop. You talk about dreams. I work with intent and vision. And in 1997, I had written out that my intent was to own my own treatment center. Wanted to be on about 20 acres of land, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, I don't own the place I work, but it's 1,100 acres working with the population that I exactly want to work, uh, doing everything that, that my experience showed me would work with alcoholics and addicts that conventional treatment was not working in. And it came, it came about, it came to pass. I don't believe that's a coincidence. I think you better get involved with the reality that you're creating with your life. You know, uh, another book says, you know, if, if you don't start getting more involved with that and start paying attention to it, then the universe is... What you're saying to the universe is, oh, it really doesn't matter what you send me. Anything's okay. <laughs> so I started to practice some of this stuff. Much more work with the 10th and 11th step in these disciplines. And uh, got moved up to uh, Dallas in uh, uh, 1999. I've been there. You know, it's funny. Joe and I have lived uh, in many different geographical places, but in many respects our experiences and path uh, have been so identical. Uh, I, when I got that moved down to Kerrville, Texas, um, it's, it's a very, very small community, and the truth was there was no one there who was doing more than I was doing with the work. So what I got thrust into was uh, in the 11th step, be quick to see where religious people are right, and I just began to devour books and uh, tapes and those kinds of things. and had some profound experiences in the middle of all that stuff. Just amazing, just amazing stuff. And uh, uh, I've known for many, many, many years that Joe and I, for however long that, that he and I uh, live in this body, we're always going to be connected and doing things. I've known that for many, many, many years. And that just continues to play out and develop. And See, he, he didn't talk much about this. Let me tell you what this work will do you. He had come back from India. You know, he'd been down there five years, so it's like, it's that old question of what am I going to do now when I grow up? And so through a series of events, you know, he came to a burning tree. And this is this, this thing about you think it's one thing, 
<laughs> but there's a much bigger picture going on, and so he came to work with us for a while, and then there came a day where it wasn't work anymore, and we had to fire him. And so uh, uh, here I am <laughs> with my with my best friend, the clinical director, and she looks at me and she goes, "Well, how are you dealing with this?" I said, "I'm dealing fine with this." I said, he, "He's my friend. I love him." I said, "Firing him has nothing to do with it, with any of that, right?" And so we calmly do that, you know, and then he he does calmly, and he's down the road, and you know, it's like, but you see, that's the kind of stuff this this. Uh, this work does, it changes you in that fashion, you know, um, and you get to be useful, maximum service to God and to your fellow human beings. Uh, but the, the thing about amends is, again, how free do you want to be? One of the reasons that there's a lot of peace with, with Joe and I inside ourselves is because of this amends process. We're not looking over our shoulder. Our conscience is not yapping to us at three o'clock in the morning about the money that we haven't paid back or the uncle we owe amends to or blah, 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 blah. Uh, it's clean. Um, an incredible way to live your life. It allows you to be much more present to the moment. Um, to understand that maybe the length of time that one is here is short. To understand that, that experience the best out of this day. To know that your life situation is constantly in flux. My my deal on a daily basis, and there are lines out of the big book, I love them, the best years of my life lie ahead of me. You can take it to the bank. You know, I, I'm 56 years old. I, I wouldn't go back one second. I feel sorry for the younger people of today. If you're under 30, I feel sorry for you. Uh, <laughs> but the best years of my life lie ahead of me. My God, what exciting, incredible stuff. You know, you spiritual living, see, there's no end to it, you know. I haven't had a chance to meet Joe's teacher in August. We're gonna, I'm going to get to go out to uh, uh, this place called Shambhala and get to spend a weekend and expose myself to him. See, that stuff's exciting. There's a monastery in uh, uh, Dallas. I'm going to go spend a minimum three days on a silent retreat uh, with myself. I, I love spiritual living in these incredible places you go, these monasteries and these ashrams. and uh, You know, you can go. There's some living mystics tooling around the country. Uh, if you ever get a chance to see Eckerd Tolle, uh, who's written the book The Power of Now, go spend some time in his presence. Top of your head will come off. Uh, but there's amazing stuff out there, and the, the big book in the 11th step tells us, be quick to see where these people are right. Now, I will warn you about something. Make sure you do that stuff along with, not instead of. I've seen a lot of people get caught in spiritual intoxication through some kind of religion, next thing you know, the religion saying to them, you don't need AA, we, we've evolved beyond that. They all get drunk. They all get drunk. Uh, I knew this intuitively a long time ago. I was shown the path to God. It was contained in the 12 steps in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that is the heart and soul of my practices. Have I done a lot with the 11th step? Absolutely. A couple of years Native American, uh, a couple years uh, with Catholicism, the Order of uh, St. Benedict, and those practices. Uh, right now, what speaks to me, quite frankly, more than anything else, is Bud Buddhism and Taoism in terms of practices and belief systems. Uh, anything that speaks of separation uh, is not in my consciousness anymore. So, for example, if, if you were a Christian and, and said that if, they're, if a person is a non-Christian, uh, they're not going to know God, my consciousness can't deal, can't even process that information based on the experiences that I've had. Just can't process it. Uh, I had an experience that lasted 40 days. Uh, it happened uh, April 28th of 1996. That altered my consciousness forever. Absolutely forever. I don't know what word you would put on it. I guess I would call it Christ consciousness. I don't know how else to say it. And that I, was as, yeah. a, as a lay monk in a, in a Christian order. He became a monk. Yeah, I renounced the world. I took on a. I don't know if I've ever hardly anyone knows any of this about me, but I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. There, well, there's there's a reason you. Um, Saint Benedict believed that there were a lot of lay people who were out in the world having to do what they have to do, who wanted to know God and and know Christ better, and so he allowed you to join the order of Saint Benedict. 
So I, me and another friend of mine went ahead and did that. We were living uh, together in a house in uh, Kerrville, Texas. And I, uh, uh, when I took that vow, I renounced the world. And I took on a religious name. The name was Oblate Brother Mark David. Uh, most people aren't aware of that. I mean, I did renounce the world. Uh, I'm in the world, but not of the world. And he and I turned our home uh, literally into a, a monastery. And uh, uh, we got up at 4 o'clock every morning, spent an hour, spent an hour every evening. And uh, But in the middle of that, I had an experience that altered my consciousness forever. And uh, did it lasted 40 days, 40 nights. I thought I was going uh, insane. Uh, I required little or no sleep. I would. That was my first experience with weeping. Crying and weeping are very, very different. Um, weeping was about experiencing a love within and without that, that was so intense that my physical body, that's all it could do to, to process it. It would just weep. And, you know, keep in mind I'm working. And I, I would go to work and, and I, would, I would be doing giving a talk or something, except I wasn't there. I, it was just... You don't run around talking about this because they lock you up if you do. <laughs> and I wasn't running around talking about this, but then everyone who would come over, I had a, a back room, I called it the sunroom, which is where I did all the work with alcoholics, and they'd come over, and typically I'll start with meditation, and, and everyone who came into that room and, and would get in my presence would start weeping. And I'll never forget this one guy, his name is Bobby W., he's from East Texas, about 6'8", huge guy. Talks real slow and talks a lot less. And so he had come and I was doing a little work. And I mean, this is a guy time in the penitentiary and rough around the edges, man. And so we get in there and we start meditating. And all of a sudden he goes, Mark, what in the hell is going on? <laughs> and I look it over and he's got just crocodile tears just pouring down out of his eyes. What in the hell have you done to me now? <laughs> oh man, did I have experience. And so I called I called my spiritual director, Father Benedict. And uh, uh, it was somewhere around 25, 30 days. I could not put words to what had happened to me. And uh, so I called him. And I did the best I could to put words uh, into into my experience. And uh, he got silent. And then he said to me, uh, well, he said, let me explain to you what it sounds to me like has happened to you. He said, when you begin this path, he said, most of the time, somewhere as a child, you are awakened to a spiritual life of some kind. I guess in AA, you guys would call it your pink cloud. And he said, you'll begin that path, and he said, you'll have periods of time where it's very sweet, and then you'll have a lot of periods of time where you're in the desert. And it's all part of the path and part of the plan. And he said, the desert for you all would probably be, maybe as you're doing those middle steps. He'd come to know that I educated him on the steps, like four through nine. And then, uh, you know, and he said, so you'll come in and out of that, in and out of that. And then he said, you'll get taken to a place. He said, you don't take yourself there. He said, you get taken to a place called dark night of the soul. And in the dark night of the soul, nothing that God has made will provide you with any satisfaction. And there also is no God. And he said, some people live through that and some people do not. And he said, if you live through that, and he said, again, this has nothing to do with you. If you live through that, you will experience a complete death of self and for a period of time, you will experience what is called a state of contemplation in which there is no ego and there's nothing but the manifestation of God that lies within you. And then he started crying. And there he said to me, he said, I've been a priest and a monk my whole life and I've wanted to taste something like that and you get to experience that. And uh, so that lasted for uh, 40 days. And then at the, uh, whew, at the end of the uh, 40 days, <laughs> Mark came back again. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't want anyone in this room to not taste that. 
to not know that there's nothing but love, to not know that you're loved in that way and, and in that fashion, to know that all is well. You know, in the middle of your deep suffering, that all is well, that that's there. Uh, that's there for us drunks, you know, that God can touch you in that uh, way. Uh, Funny how this works. I don't know if I've ever talked about this to this extent, but uh, well, that's all I got for now. So I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know how. Uh, I don't know how a guy like me ends up ends up in those kind of places. Um, I don't even know how you get from where I was on Wednesday to here. You can't get from where I was on Wednesday to here. Another, uh, so I was 15 years sober hitting bottom with all this stuff, too much of everything. Thought I would move back to Denver and um, seemed like a good idea. And thank God for the ego, because my ego, I canceled a two-year speaking calendar, except for two. Billings, Montana, and Sydney, Australia. Billings, I could have gone on my own money, but I just went. And I had an idea that uh, before the convention, I would go to a meeting, and I, didn't, I wouldn't say anything. And I um, went, went on Thursday, like I did this week, and um, sat in this meeting, and... Um, didn't tell him who I thought I was or why I was there or my name or nothing. I, and um, these good old boys were sitting there and uh, halfway through the meeting, one of them says, you know this guy from Santa Monica, Joe Hawk, he says blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and it wasn't that somebody did that. It was what my mind did with it after. And after I watched my mind, I said to myself, you're going to drink again. You really better move back to Colorado. Went to the conference, gave either the worst talk or the best talk I've ever given, depending on how you look at it. And at that conference, I had another wise idea, and that was I was going to take this AA member to lunch the next day, and I was going to tell, 30, he's 35 years sober, I'm 14, and I'm going to tell him about the spiritual part of Alcoholics Anonymous. He was, it was a guy I didn't like, but I'd never met him. We all can relate to that. And I didn't like him because every time I heard one of his tapes, it was a new message. This time it's white flour, now it's sugar, now it's cigarettes, now it's this. And I didn't know that what I didn't like about this guy was he was reflecting everything I didn't like about myself. Most people we don't like are just mirrors. And I invite him to lunch, and I had spoken for I, And I used to watch my ego, because I know I can't defeat my own ego. But if you still think you can defeat your own ego, you spend a lot of time trying to work on it. See, I'm not into self-help anymore. I want to be rid of self. I don't want to increase self. I found a lot of techniques in America and to increase that which I'm trying to get free of. And so I watched my ego, and I used to watch whether I wanted to be the Friday night speaker or the Sunday morning speaker. I've never really been a Saturday night kind of guy. but um, <laughs> And um, you know why? You know, because if you speak on Friday night, you get all this attention the rest of the weekend. And if you speak on Sunday morning, nobody knows you the whole weekend, and you just talk and go home. And I was the Friday night speaker, and I was watching that. And I thought I would ask this guy to go to lunch on Saturday, and I'm going to tell him about the work. We went to lunch. And before I opened my big mouth, he said, what was your name again? I thought that was great. That was so great. <laughs> and uh, he said, where do you live? I said, Santa Monica. He said, how long are you sober? I said, 14. He said, when I was 14 years sober... I was living in Santa Monica, writing scripts for television, living in the Santa Monica Shores apartment building, 100 pounds overweight, smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, sponsoring 20, 30 people, speaking two, three times a month out of state, five or six times a month in L.A. Uh, with adult type 2 diabetes. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm in the same building, the same apartment building, with all those other things. And by the time he was done, I was just laughing my head off. <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't tell him about the spiritual part of Alcoholics Anonymous. 
we became friends, and I really thought, that's that's it. I got to move back to Colorado. And uh, little did I know what God had. You know what's this? What's this slogan in AA? You'll never, you won't always get what you want, but you'll always get what you need. Well, what happens if after a few years you've gotten everything you've ever needed, more than you've ever wanted, and your and your own dreams, your own dreams have been exceeded by that which God has for you? Then what do you do? You surrender to that. It's a second step state of consciousness. Whether it's your first time in the second step or your umpteenth time. And the state of consciousness goes like this. Anything God has in mind for me is better than anything I ever have or ever will have in mind for me. Yeah. So uh, I went back, to, back home and then I'm going to go to Sydney, Australia. Now why did I keep that one? Well, I would like to see Sydney, but I really want to be able to tell my friends I'm going to speak in Sydney, Australia. And they called me from Sydney, and uh, um, they said, uh, change your ticket, we're taking you to see the Dalai Lama. I said, great, I've never seen him. Now, I'd had some good teachers. Of course, my first and foremost teacher who saved my life, God being in his, because God's in his life, is Don Pritz. And he's still my sponsor. He's been my sponsor for 20, 20 years. My second teacher was Don Coyas a member of our program, a Native American man who worked with me for a couple of years. We did it backwards. We spent a year on 10, 11, and 12 and then did one through nine. My next teacher was Dr. Jim Finley who lived with Thomas Merton for many years at Gethsemane who's now in private practice in Santa Monica. They all taught me amazing things, but I've had a lot of other teachers. Resentment, <laughs> fear, sex, money, people I like, people I don't like, Mark, you, myself, my own mind, my defects. <laughs> Once you see it, it's everywhere. Once you see truth, you see it everywhere. Here's a line that really struck my heart when I heard it. You take a stranger by the hand. You walk across the dirt and sand. A man who doesn't even understand his wildest dreams. Then you walk across the dirt and sand to an ocean that he's never dreamed. I thought, wow, that's what we do. And that's in a song by you, too. You never know where you're going to see it, right? <laughs> so I'm going to go to Australia. I mentioned this to one person. Well, I mentioned it to uh, every person, actually. But I mentioned it to one person in particular who's still a great friend of mine, Lisa Cherry. And, um, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to Sydney. They're taking me to see the Dalai Lama. She says, you should meet this young kid in AA, Dominic. I meet this boy. He tells me an amazing story how he ended up in India. And I said, wow, what a great story. He said, will you take a letter to one of the Dalai Lama's monks? You have no trouble finding him. I said, sure. It was all in Tibetan. He gave me one name, S-O-G-A-N. Off I go to Sydney. I did the AA stuff. I loved it. I felt new for the first time in a couple years. I actually thought I was going to come back to America, get a long-term visa, go back to Sydney uh, for the winter, and then move to Colorado. God had another plan, even better than that. And um, so off I go to Sydney. I did the AA stuff. Really enjoyed it. I get to this Tibetan gathering. There's 20 or 30,000 monks and nuns, people from all over the world. The Dalai Lama's never given these teachings in the Southern Hemisphere, this certain teaching. And uh, I'm walking around this Tibetan festival, and I never felt anything like it in my life. I'd seen a, a Lama here and a Tibetan there, but never together. And I don't like to admit this, but in the middle of that experience, I felt I knew these Tibetan people in my heart more than I ever felt that I was an American. And I don't know what that means. Uh, not better than I ever knew anybody. But I knew something was going on. It was one of those experiences. And I told my friends, I need to do this alone, and I'll meet you at our seats. I couldn't take it. It was so powerful after about an hour, because we'd gone really early to get our tickets. I went in the auditorium. I was taught in AA, you go to the front. You go right to the front. I'm sitting, I'm not even concerned where my seat is. I'm sitting in the front row in this empty auditorium, and I thought, oh my God, I have this letter from this kid, Dominic. How in the world would I ever find this man, this monk, that this letter's for? And then I re remembered that I don't have to find this person. And uh, sat 
close my eyes. I don't know how long it was, but I opened my eyes, and there's a monk standing in front of me, closer than you, smiling and looking at me. And I thought, oh, I'm in his seat. The auditorium's <laughs> filling up. <coughs> there's nobody else in the whole auditorium yet. This is a 40,000-seat auditorium. And uh, he's looking at me. And I don't know if he speaks English or not. I don't know what to do, so I hand him this letter. He goes, oh, I know, Dominic. I'll go get Sogan Rinpoche. Not only did he know who wrote the letter, not only did he speak English, he knew who the letter was to, and he brought me to them. I delivered this letter to this monk that I felt some sort of great connection with, didn't think much, and he told me to come back in two days, and he would give me a letter to take home to this kid. Saw the Dalai Lama for the first time in person, didn't understand all the, the uh, didn't understand it in, all in my mind, even though it was in English. I had an experience once in India with people who don't speak English that people who don't speak English understand me about as much as people who do speak English. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, came back to get two days later to get that letter from him to take home. And uh, he gave me the letter. We made a little small talk. He walked about that far to the door and he looked at me and I swear to God, I didn't know it then, but I believe it now. He looked through every life I've ever had. And uh, he said something to the translator. She was puzzled, asked him to repeat. She comes over and she says, uh, Lama Sogan Rinpoche would like you to come to Dharmsal and allow him to be your teacher. And my head's going like this, yes, and my mind is going, where in the hell is Dharmsal? <laughs> I didn't even know where it was. But my heart knew I was going there because of this connection I felt with him. Now, if that wasn't enough, I get on the plane. Of course, I'm alcoholic. My mind starts. How could I ever go there? What would I do? I know I'm moving back to Colorado. My mind just went crazy. Thank God I was in that mode of letting go of Los Angeles. It's not easy to let go of comfort. You worship comfort, it's hard to get free of comfort. Because it's comfortable by its own nature, it's hard to get free of. So I was in this mode of letting go. Get back to LA, I called the boy, told him to come over and get his letter. He read the letter, of course, most of it was to him. He said, I'm puzzled, and this, this boy speaks perfect Tibetan. And uh, he's reading, he says, I'm puzzled by the first paragraph, the rest I understand. A week before all this happened, I'd met another master from Taiwan, not a Tibetan monk. And I'd asked him a simple question, how will I know when I meet my next teacher? And his answer to me actually made me a little mad. I thought he was sloughing me off. He said, you'll know when you meet your next teacher when you hear the name Big Dharma. I thought, that's stupid. So I give this letter to Dominic. He says, this first paragraph puzzles me. I says, what does it say? And he says, it says, your friend Big Dharma has agreed to come to Dharmsa and allow me to be his teacher and he'll stay as long as he would like. And he wrote that two days before we ever spoke and called me the name that a man told me I would hear when I met my next teacher. Now, I might be alcoholic, but I don't need a two-by-four to, <laughs> to at least respond to that. But when my mind would go crazy, I would just say, hey, if I don't like it, I'm going to Colorado, you know? I'm going home to my sponsor. And, uh, you know, being a good alcoholic, I go for a two-month visit. I stayed five years. <laughs> Took a break every year. And I don't know how stuff like that happens to me. And I always think the reason I'm going there is the reason I'm supposed to stay. You know, like Mark said, you know, she, I meet a woman and I have the children named and why she's going to dump me and I'm pissed before we even get to talk. <laughs> Three of my fiancés, I don't think I was supposed to marry any one of them because I didn't, but I, they were supposed to just come to the work and find their own truth. And I think I'm going to India to just do this for me and spend time with this teacher. And I ended up getting to start a drug and alcohol treatment program for the Tibetan government for the first time in their history. How does a guy like me get to do that? You follow your heart, you trust God. They now have a detox in the, dharms, in the hospital. They now have an outpatient program run by the first Tibetan boy to get sober in our program. And he did the work. And a long-term place for people who can stay for more than 30 or 60 or 90 days. I know this, that all my suffering comes from my unwillingness to do God's will. And that always has to do with greed and attachment. I'm either grasping for something or I'm clinging to something. 
and all of my grasping and all of my clinging has to do with ignorance because I think I'm going to get something from something that's impermanent. There's only one thing that's permanent. <laughs> and I'm either after something that's impermanent and human or I'm holding on to something that's imper- permanent and human because I don't want to submit to the will of God and it causes pain. But when you've been addicted to pain, that's not such a bad thing. You know, we're more afraid of getting free of pain. We're more afraid of getting free of fear. We're more afraid of really having any power than remaining powerless. It's so much easier to remain asleep. It's not as much fun. There's not as much freedom in it. It can be painful. There's a lot of ups and downs. But when you get free of... Circ- I raised a question the other the, when we started about the first step. I would like to bring that question back now to, to the other side of the work when you're done with every amends you're aware of. And the question was, why do you think you're alcoholic? Is it because of circumstance? No, I drink no matter how things are. Is it because of emotional state? No, I drink no matter how I'm feeling. Now I would like to raise the question, how do, why do you believe God's working in your life today? Is it the parking lot God? Circumstantial God? You know God loves you because there was a parking place just for you today. Things are going your way. That's a big setup by the ego. The ego's using that for the day when there's no parking space and things aren't going your way and your ego will go, see, he don't love you today, <laughs> but I know something that will, just as it always did. What about the emotional God? I know that God's working in my life today because I feel good most of the time. I'm at peace. That's also a big setup for the day when you're not at peace. You know these people in A that say that fear and faith can't exist in the same place? They better. There's all these philosophies in AA about when I will most need God, he's, he's not going to be there. He better be there when there's fear. And he has been. To let go of the good lifestyle. It's not hard to let go of crap. It's not scary when you're new when you ain't got nothing to let go of. Take 15, 20, 30 years of good stuff and ask for an open mind and a new experience that what you think you know about it be let go. I heard a woman with 45 years who ran the Denver Central Office for a long time say that doing the work after a a number of years, it's like taking your life and throwing it up in the air and giving it to God and see where it lands. I I respect anybody with with long-term sobriety who's willing to say, Dear God, please put aside what I think I know for an open mind and a new experience. Because good stuff's not easy to let go by its own nature. We like holding on to what's comfortable. I could have easily stayed in Denver, shared that house with Mark for another 20, 30 years, and, you know, just gone on the way. Well, I could have easily stayed in Los Angeles, but I can get done if I'm committed to seeking God. I can get done with good stuff that's killing me just as much as bad stuff that's easy to let go of. And now i got to say to you, I don't even know the difference anymore between good and bad. I don't even think they're separate anymore. I also didn't get to tell you, how does a guy like me in, in the five years that I was in India, I was one year in retreat. Four different times. Three months, three months, three months, three months. Out of five years, I gave one year to silence. And I, and I get changed. But like Mark said, you don't have to go to India and study with the Dalai Lama to wake up. Right? You make time. You make time for meditation. If it's not a priority, it won't be. You've got to make time, and you've got to make a place. You've got to make a place that's special to you, and then you'll start to find a place that's special to you deeper and deeper inside, and all of a sudden it won't be just in that place that you have in front of you where you sit. It'll be the rest of the room, and the dining room, the living room, the bathroom. God's even in the bathroom, and the rest of the house. And then that mandala will start to grow, and it'll go into the lives of others, and you'll come to love that. That's what I love. And how does a guy like me who only cared about himself get taken to a place like that. Um, This is one of my favorite stories, and then we'll have to go. Um, The time came for the student to part from his teacher. The teacher placed the soles of his feet on the top of the student's head, symbolizing their work together was done. The student was about to depart. However, the teacher said, and they always get you some way, don't they? There's one particular profound teaching I have yet to impart to anyone. I haven't given this teaching to anyone. But it's probably too precious to give away just like that, so you may as well go. The two embraced. The student walks away. Just as the student got out of earshot, he heard the teacher calling, Hurry back! Hurry back! He bowed once more before his teacher. 
Whereupon the teacher turned his back to the student, lifted up his robes, exposed his bare buttocks, entirely covered with thick calluses from years and years of meditation. And he says, with his robes pulled up and his buttocks exposed, this is my final teaching to you, my beloved student. Now, just do it. Thanks for letting us be here.